morning. Good to have you with us on this Wednesday. I'm Joe Fryer in New York. And I'm Zinclair Samoa in Washington, D.C., in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, do not travel. This morning, a renewed warning to Americans traveling to high-risk regions as the two survivors of a deadly kidnapping in Mexico return home to U.S. soil. Now the FBI looking into what led up to the violent abduction that left two Americans dead. Attacks on U.S. citizens are unacceptable no matter where or under what circumstance, circumstances they happen. What we're learning about the victims and the survivors, plus how that deadly trip across the border is exposing the reality of cartel violence in Mexico. Too far shocking revelations from a $1.6 billion lawsuit against Fox News. The private conversations just unsealed that appear to show concerns by owner Rupert Murdoch about former President Donald Trump's false claims about the 2020 election. Also this morning, danger to children. A warning from health officials about an alarming rise in children's deaths by drug poisoning. The one drug responsible for nearly half of those deaths and what parents need to know to keep Keep your kids safe. Finally, breaking the bias on this International Women's Day, we'll explore the challenges women still face even in a modern industry and how one woman is working to make artificial intelligence more inclusive. Can't wait to get to that one on this International Women's Day, Joe. Good to yeah, see you. Good to see you too, Zinclay. We begin this morning with the latest developments in the deadly kidnapping of four Americans in Mexico. Two of those Americans, Latavia Washington McGee and Eric Williams, are now back on U.S. soil. McGee was not hurt in the attack. Williams was shot in the leg. They were rescued yesterday in Matamoros, four days after gunmen opened fire on their vehicle. They were kidnapped just after crossing the border from Texas. Two others in the group are dead. They have been identified by family members as Shaheed Woodward and Zin Del Brown. Now, <clears throat> the state where this happened, the governor said an innocent Mexican bystander was also killed in the attack. And now this morning, families of the victims are speaking out about the harrowing ordeal. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us from Lake City, South Carolina. That is where the victims are from. Ellison, good morning. So what are the latest details we have on the rescue? And do we know at this point, was this a case of kidnapping for ransom? At this point, authorities in Mexico say they believe this was a case of mistaken identity. The attorney general for the state where this happened in, Tamaulipas, that's where the city of Matamoros is located. He says that this appears to be a situation where you had this group of Americans crossing into Mexico at about 9.18 a.m. He says two hours later, that's when their van came under fire. They say that after they were all forced into the back of that pickup truck. Then they were moved to a number of different locations. Authorities in Mexico say that was, they believe that what was happening in each of those movements was that the kidnappers were trying to confuse rescue efforts and create a bit of a distraction. So they kept moving them until they were found in this wooden cabin. Again, though, they are saying at this point in time, they are still investigating. One person was arrested who was reportedly guarding uh, the area where they were being held. But in terms of the motivations behind what initially took place, they say it seems like this was simply a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This state of Mexico, it does have a very high travel warning from the State Department. It's listed as do not travel. And the reason the State Department gives for that is they say because there's a risk of high crime in this area and also kidnapping. Joe. So Ellison, we are also hearing from family members of the victims this morning. What are they saying? Yeah, our colleague Gabe Gutierrez spoke to the wife of Eric Williams. He was the one who was reportedly shot in the leg. According to Mexican authorities, he is recovering in the hospital. Uh, his wife confirmed that she spoke to him as he was heading into surgery. Here's more of what she told Gabe. I didn't know anything until uh, Sunday morning. Um, when the FBI came. Everything just seemed so surreal to me. I am uh, very happy that he's alive, but I'm also heartbroken for the family who can't stay the same. 
The mayor of this city, Lake City, confirmed that all four of the victims here had ties to this community. This has been described as their hometown. Uh, family members have told NBC News that all of them were childhood friends and that one of the four was going to Mexico for an elective cosmetic procedure and the others, a cousin and friends, went with them so they could share driving responsibilities along the way. This is a community watching this very closely and certainly grieving and we expect there to be a vigil sometime later this evening. Joe? And Allison, I mean, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland spoke yesterday, blamed the deaths on drug cartels. Let's listen to that. Cartels are responsible for the deaths of Americans. And we are fighting as hard as possible. The DEA and the FBI are doing everything possible to dismantle and disrupt and ultimately prosecute the, the leaders of the cartels and the entire networks uh, that they depend on. And Allison, I mean, we know the area is home to the notorious Gulf drug cartel. I mean, do we have any idea at all if that group was behind the kidnapping? So we don't know specifically which group was behind it at this point in time. Mexican authorities, U.S. officials, they have said they believe this was carried out uh, by a cartel group. You mentioned the one in particular that is known, uh, well known in this area. Sinaloa cartel also uh, has activities that take place in this area. Mexican authorities have said they are still in the process of investigating this and trying to figure out exactly who uh, played a role in this and arrest them, bring them to justice. But for now, the only information we have about the alleged abductors or people tied to it is that Mexican authorities say they arrested a 24-year-old who was watching guard over the four uh, when they recovered them. Joe. All right, Allison, thank you so much. And staying at the border, the Biden administration is considering restarting a controversial policy that would allow border officials to hold migrants who enter the country illegally with their children. The policy was lifted two years ago by President Biden, and since then, border officials have been releasing families into the U.S. with ankle monitor systems and other trackable devices. The potential tr change comes as the Biden administration prepares for the end of the Trump-era policy, Title 42. In a statement, the Department of Homeland Security said, quote, no decisions have been made as we prepare for the Title 42 public health order to lift. The administration will continue to prioritize safe, orderly, and humane processing of migrants. NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee joins us now for more on this. Carol, good morning. So I think the biggest question here is why is the Biden administration considering this policy again, even though they stopped implementing it two years ago? Well, it all has to do with this lifting of Title 42, which is expected to happen on May 11th. The administration has been trying to figure out how to deal with this because there's expected to be an influx of migrants at the border, and that's a huge problem for the administration. So what they're doing is looking at restarting this controversial policy that started, in, that President Biden ended at the start of his administration. It, it detains immigrants at, and their families at the border for a Temporarily, instead of releasing them in, into the U.S., known as family detention policy. Now, two sources familiar with the matter tell NBC News that the White House and members of the Department of Homeland Security have been discussing this policy in recent days, having multiple meetings where they're looking at what this might look like, how it would work, and things like that, although no decisions, we're told, have been made. And Carol, what is at stake here, both for the Biden administration, but beyond the policy, the people, right, for the migrants and the migrant families yeah. who are crossing the border? Yeah, that's a, a great question because this is going to really change for migrants coming across the border. And whereas they would normally be in current policy, be released temporarily into the U.S. with ankle monitoring. This means that these families will be detained at the border, as has, was been the, has been the case in previous administrations. Is the policy that was started by the Obama administration in 2014. It was continued by the Trump administration, and then it was obviously reversed when President Biden took office. And one of the reasons he said that he was going to reverse that policy is because he wanted to have a more humane immigration policy. So for the president, what's the risk there for him is politically, this is a big reversal. Members of his own party are not happy about this. And the risk, further risk, is that he would take a step like this and yet it wouldn't resolve the problem. Definitely a major reversal, and it's something the White House addressed, the possibility of this policy returning during yesterday's press briefing. Let's take a listen. 
We've been very clear on how we're looking to how the president wants to move forward, and he's been clear from the start, from the beginning of his administration, by putting forth a comprehensive immigration reform. And his approach has been making sure that we expand legal pathways uh, for asylum uh, seekers, limiting illegal, illegal immigration, addressing root causes, and also increasing border security. A lot of people have compared what the president is doing as either extending what Trump did or being very Trump-like, and I just want to make sure that that is not that is not what is happening here. What we saw in this last administration, the administration before us, was a gutting of the immigration system. So that's White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre. So walk us through how Biden's immigration goals stalled in Congress. Has he been able to accomplish what he set out to do at the beginning of his term? And also, obviously, this move, as she addressed, has Biden being compared to former President Trump in some instances. So how are Democrats responding to that? Well, on your first question, this president's goals for immigration policy have gone nowhere in Congress. He put forward a comprehensive immigration plan at the start of his administration. Democrats had control of the House and the Senate. That policy went nowhere, and it's increasingly like unlikely to go anywhere now that Republicans have control of the House and we're heading into an election year. As for you know whether Democrats and immigration advocates, how they've reacted, look, immigration advocates are saying, this is Trump 2.0. This is a terrible policy. This is not what President Biden said he would do. You can see there the White House is very sensitive about being compared to former President Trump's immigration policies. And so at the same time, you hear Democrats, the head of the Homeland Security Committee, the top Democrat there in the House, said that he was alarmed by that the administration was even considering this policy and that calling this cruel and harmful to children and additionally that it doesn't work. Now, the White House is sort of fueling this by not confirming or denying that these discussions are happening from Corrine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, wouldn't do that. And so this is still hanging out there. And although the administration says, according to our reporting, that no decisions yet have been made. A lot to watch from the White House. Carol Lee, thank you so much. The billionaire owner of Fox News, Rupert Murdoch, says that network host Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, quote, maybe went too far in pushing false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. The comments were made in an email to Fox News CEO Suzanne Scott. They were revealed in unsealed court documents from that $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against the news network filed by Dominion Voting Systems. NBC News senior reporter Jane Chim, Jane Tim joins us now with more on this. So Jane, even more bombshell revelations in this latest trove of court documents. Tell us a little more about this email from Murdoch. What exactly did he say? Joe, these, these documents are, are revelatory, the widest and biggest picture we've seen yet. This email came the day after Biden was inaugurated, and he's talking about a meeting with Republican senators and complaining that he's getting mud thrown at us. Uh, and he asks one of his colleagues, is it inarguable that high-profile Fox voices fed the story the election was stolen and that January 6th was an important chance to have the results overturned? This request from the top chair at Fox Corporation was punted it down to an executive who responded about seven hours later with 15 pages of examples feeding into that idea. This is where we're starting to see just how much Fox executives knew and were worried about their audience, but also worried about whether or not they were telling the truth here. Uh, Jane, another interesting thing to come out of this was a negative text message about former President Trump sent by Fox News host Tucker Carlson. What did that say, and are there any other revelations that we're seeing in these unsealed documents? You know, these texts are just shocking. Uh, one of the things he said, Tucker Carlson texting, I hate him passionately. He's talking about President Trump. I can't handle more of this. He adds, we're very close to being able to ignore Donald Trump. This was, of course, January 4th. The messages that I see in these documents around January 4th, January 5th, with executives up to Rupert Murdoch suggesting maybe we need to say Joe Biden won the election. Maybe that would stop the stolen election myth. Those are only Almost direct quotes from Murdoch emails on January 5th. 24 hours later, of course, we know Capitol was stormed by a mob and, and that myth lives. 
And so, Jane, amid this lawsuit, what's the response from Fox News and from Dominion to these latest revelations? You know, Dominion says these exhibits speak from themselves. Fox is a, in, instead pointing to saying what they think is uh, Dominion is, is sort of cherry picking and misleading based on the evidence. They say the context in these full exhibits, because of course we've seen some excerpts of these in the past. They say the full exhibits tell the story and that Dominion is, is misusing their words. You definitely see a wider picture in in these exhibits and perhaps a, a look at what that might be the Fox defense come this April trial. Uh, but it's definitely just revelatory stuff here, Joe. All right, Jane, Tim, Jane, thank you so much. Now to Capitol Hill for what's expected to be a very busy day. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is scheduled to testify before Congress for the second day in a row as inflation worries linger. And he's not exactly offering good news when it comes to those interest rate hikes that have, he's been teasing. Here now to unpack it all for us is congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, good morning. So what did Powell have to say about those interest rate hikes? Yeah, the U.S. Central Bank chief with a stark warning for Congress. Remember, he already raised interest rates eight times over the last year alone. And he said due to hotter than expected economy and the inflation rate still at around six and a half percent, that might have to happen again and at an accelerated rate. Take a listen to what he said. Although inflation has been moderating in recent months, the process of getting inflation back down to two percent has a long way to go and is likely to be bumpy. As I mentioned, the latest economic data have come in stronger than expected, which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be, to be higher than previously anticipated. If the totality of the data were to indicate <clears throat> that faster tightening is warranted, we'd be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. Yeah, so or is the next set of data that they are prepared to receive are on March 14th. The agency then will meet at the end of March to determine how much to raise interest rates by. Of course, that was faced with bipartisan backlash from Republicans and Democrats to this because this could hit every sector of the market. And of course, with Powell's comments already, uh, investment markets have been jumping at this. Uh, we've seen concern from not only the U.S., but also uh, globally to his remarks there because he suggested that uh, while the Fed raised interest rates just a quarter of a percentage point last month, that could jump back up to half a percentage point, of course, concerning lawmakers in the room. And Julie, beyond economics, let's talk a bit about the political side of this. What was the response from lawmakers to Powell's warning about more possible interest rate hikes? Well, you can imagine this happened before the Senate Banking Committee, though Democrats do control the Senate. There were some Republicans on the panel suggesting that perhaps federal spending and energy, Biden's energy uh, policies on this, especially in light of the war in Ukraine waged by Russia, could contribute to this. Uh, but you also had Democrats, especially progressives in the room. I'm talking about Senator Elizabeth Warren, who spoke to the job losses that these interest hikes could bring and the fact that Companies were still profiting despite these higher interest rate hikes affecting consumers and affecting employees. Take a listen to that heated exchange. Four and a half Explain percent. that to the two million families who are going to be out of work. We're not, again, we're not targeting any of that. We're, but I would say even four and a half percent unemployment is is well better than than most of the time for the last you know 75 years. In other words, you don't have a plan to stop a runaway train if it occurs. You know, Chair Powell, you are gambling with people's lives. Powell will we be back on the Hill today before the House, of course, Republican controlled. So that will also not be easy for him as he prepares uh, again to raise interest rates potentially as the economy just continues to soar despite all of these hikes uh, that the agency has already put in place. And Julie, briefly, while we have you, I do want to turn to another high-profile hearing we're expecting today. The acting administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration expected to testify. What do we think we're going to hear? Yeah, well, Senator Ted Cruz is the top Republican on the Senate Commerce Committee, where Billy Nolan, the acting FAA administrator, is expected to come before. And I raised Ted Cruz because last week the panel actually had before it the Biden's current FAA administrator, the nominee for that position, Phil Washington and Cruz, uh, exp expressing concerns over his nomination. But look, today's hearing is set to focus on the safety reforms the FAA is putting into place, particularly after two deadly Boeing crashes that left 400 people 
than in 2018 and 2019. So the FAA is certainly in the hot seat today on Capitol Hill. A lot to watch in the sky and on the hill. Julie Serkin, thank you. Time for a check on your morning news now weather forecast. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. We've got a couple of systems that we're tracking over the next couple of days that are going to be impactful to the West Coast, the central portions of the United States, and eventually the East Coast. So let's start with exactly what's going on. You see the radar showing some rain extending basically from Texas to Missouri and snow from Missouri up into Minnesota. Here's where we're expecting the heaviest of the rain. Some of these totals ending up one, maybe two inches. So the risk, again, is for flash flooding through the day today. We saw a similar story yesterday. We're going to see a similar set up today. Little Rock, Texarkana, Fort Smith, and Wichita Falls all included in that slight risk for flash flooding through this afternoon and into this evening. Now, let's talk about the winter alerts. We have 15 million people under them. They extend into parts of the upper Midwest and Northern Plains and, of course, out west into California, where we are tracking that next system to bring them ample amounts of moisture in the coming days. But let's talk about what happens here as we go through the next few days for that system that's going to impact the Central Plains and has prompted those winter alerts for parts of the North. Northern Plains. Here's how it uh, how it plays out. We'll see a steady kind of snow stretched across the Upper Plains in the Midwest here as we get into tomorrow. We'll also see the heavy rain continue from the Tennessee Valley into parts of Texas. Uh, and then as we get into Friday, we'll gear up for some snow to push into the Great Lakes, eventually the Northeast. As we go into the overnight hours on Saturday, we'll start to see some rain, some snow working in uh, for the Mid-Atlantic and up into the Northeast into our weekend. This will be something that we'll have to deal with. You can see there's a mix of the rain uh, and the snow especially for interior areas of New England and the Northeast. But by the time we get to Saturday evening, that system pushes offshore. We're left with just some windy conditions. Snowfall amounts for parts of the upper Midwest, anywhere from six to even nine inches are, is possible. So we'll be tracking that. Additionally, an atmospheric river event is setting up for folks in on the West Coast where we'll see ample amounts of rain working in. You can see some of that heavy rain and even the strong winds are going to lead us to uh, structural issues. Once again, we've seen this play out over and over. So far this winter and there's more to come heavy rain and snow possible for the sierras and more of that melt could lead to some flooding concerns for folks there guys all right a lot to keep an eye on angie thank you so much coming up on morning news now addressing his state with an eye on the white house when we come back what could be the final state of the state address from florida governor ron DeSantis. the speculation grows that he could be running for president and new developments in the investigation into the origins of COVID-19. We'll tell you about the hearing set for later today as the U.S. prepares to lift testing requirements for travelers in China. Next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is heralding the state as an example of American excellence, saying, quote, the bottom line, Florida is number one. That declaration made at the start of his State of the State speech just yesterday. That robust delivery coming as DeSantis is expected to announce his run for president in May when the legislative session comes to an end. NBC News correspondent Ali Vitale has the details. Governor Ron DeSantis touting Florida as an American blueprint. Florida is number one, and working together, we will ensure that Florida remains the number one state in these United States. Kicking off the start of a new legislative session there that's just as much about policies in the Sunshine State as it is about a national roadmap for Republicans. Florida is the fastest growing state in the nation. We rank number one for net in migration. We rank number one in the nation for new business formations. Florida has more people employed today than before the pandemic. We are number one in law enforcement recruitment and support. Florida's crime rate stands at a 50-year low. It echoes DeSantis' new book, released last week, that seeks to establish Florida under his stewardship as an incubator for conservative policies and culture wars. From classrooms... We've expanded school choice and we have protected the rights of parents. To anti-COVID vaccine mandates. Stop with this COVID theater. So if you want to wear it, fine, but this is, a, this is ridiculous. We defied the experts. We bucked the elites. We ignored the chatter. We did it our way. The Florida way. DeSantis also taking aim at President Biden's immigration policies. We have fought against illegal immigration in the state of Florida 
from banning sanctuary cities to suing the Biden administration over its catch and release policies to transporting illegal aliens to sanctuary jurisdictions. And railing against gender affirming care. And it's sad that we have to say this, but our children are not guinea pigs for science experimentation and we cannot allow people to make money off mutilating them. All key DeSantis priorities and all sure to dominate the next 18 months of presidential politics on the right as DeSantis is widely seen as the top rival to former President Donald Trump. But critics, even those in his own party, say he may be playing too much to the extremes. It was certainly a red meat speech. And this red meat is awful conservative. I think he's probably going too far to the right and more than he would probably need to right now for, for general election. Because being, frankly, to have a racist, anti-gay, gun-toting, anti-abortion agenda really isn't going to play well when it comes to independent suburban women. Still, the start of the GOP majority session is a stark reminder of why sources close to DeSantis vow he's focused first on his current job before he sets his sights on his next one. Not that it stops him from teasing what's ahead. Don't worry about the chattering class. Ignore all the background noise. Keep the compass set to true north. We will stand strong. We will hold the line. We won't back down. And I can promise you this, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yes. Thank you all. God bless you. Our thanks to Ali Vitali for that reporting. NBC News has learned that America is planning to lift COVID-19 testing requirements for travelers from China as early as Friday. That's according to a source familiar with the matter. And this morning, a House panel investigating the origins of the virus will hold its first hearing. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us from Hong Kong with all this. So, Josh, what more can you tell us about this plan to lift testing requirements for travelers from China? Why now? And what is the reaction like in China to this move? Well, when the U.S. put these restrictions in place, they cited the fact uh, that they had concerns about growing waves of COVID cases in China and particularly about a lack of transparency from China's government uh, about the data that they were providing the international community uh, about their COVID cases. But now a person familiar with the matter confirms to NBC the U.S. is lifting those requirements or will soon uh, because there is now data that they have seen that shows that cases, deaths and hospitalizations in China from COVID-19 uh, are all dropping. But of course, the U.S. is leaving open the possibility they could put restrictions back in place in the future, saying they're continuing to monitor the situation. China's government, meanwhile, responding, saying that any restrictions should always be moderate and scientific based. And they hope that this step will help to facilitate additional travel between people from the two countries. We mentioned just a moment ago this morning, the House Select Subcommittee on the COVID pandemic is holding its first hearing on the origins of the virus. What can we expect to come from that? Well, this first hearing will include testimony from Dr. Robert Redfield, who, uh, of course, chaired the CDC uh, during the Trump administration during the beginning uh, of COVID. Uh, and we expect this largely to focus on uh, Republican lawmakers' criticisms of uh, the way that this has been handled, particularly by the Biden administration. Uh, we've already seen Republicans coming out ahead of this hearing uh, with sharp attacks on Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, but here in China, they are also watching this very closely. Uh, they say that this evidence that certain uh, parts of the U.S. government have put out with low confidence saying that the origins of COVID might have been from a, a lab leak in China are evidence of the U.S. politicizing the issue and trying to use COVID-19 to discredit China, Joe. Yeah, I mean, these U.S. intelligence theories on the origins of COVID, how is that playing really into the broader tensions between China and the U.S.? And what all are we hearing from Beijing about those theories? Well, they say that this all should be based on science, that the investigation shouldn't be based on uh, politics. And China maintains that it has been transparent uh, in providing the information and offering to cooperate with international investigations. Of course, the U.S., including FBI Director Ray, says that China continues to obstruct investigations into, uh, into the origins of COVID. And so that disagreement right there, as you point out, Joe, really reflects how this is playing into that uh, broader uh, sense of conflict between the two countries as the foreign minister of China uh, said just in his news conference yesterday that the U.S. is putting these two countries on an inevitable path towards conflict. Words getting a lot of headlines. All right, Josh Letterman in Hong Kong. Josh, thank you so much.
Sticking with international news, Russian forces could be making gains in eastern Bakhmut. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us from Tel Aviv with this and other world headlines. Raf, good morning. Joe Zinkley, good morning. That's right. Ukrainian forces are vowing to battle on in the besieged city of Bakhmut. Russia's Wagner mercenary group claims to have taken control of the eastern half of the city, but Ukrainian troops are holding on in the west. Both sides suffering heavy casualties, but President Zelensky says his military leaders are united in their commitment to holding the city. French protesters have been blocking oil refineries as they take to the streets against plans to raise the country's retirement age to 64. French citizens can currently retire at 62, but Emmanuel Macron says there is no choice but to raise that as people are now living longer. More than a million demonstrators turned out to protest on Tuesday. And finally, Colombia has opened military service to women for the first time in 25 years. The country already has mandatory military service for young men, but now women can voluntarily choose to serve. Many of the first cohort of female recruits say they see military service as a stepping stone towards educational opportunities. So happy International Women's Day to those new Colombian troops and to all the other women in our lives. Guys. Who run the world? them, apparently. That's what we said. <laughs> Thank you, Rap. Rap, thanks. <laughs> and coming up, Weight Watchers making a major move. When we come back, the company's latest acquisition as it works weight loss drugs into its program. And the warning from health officials about the dangers of hot tap water, what you can do to keep your family safe. This is Morning News Now. We're back with a closer look at a big move by Weight Watchers. The fitness and diet company is now expanding into the booming market of weight loss drugs. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the details. The old guard of weight loss is getting on board with the latest weight loss sensation. My clothes fit differently. My diet has changed. WW International, formerly known as Weight Watchers, announced it is buying the company's sequence for $100 million. The subscription service helps overweight customers access groundbreaking new medications like Ozempic for diabetes and Wagovi for obesity. The drugs are made with semaglutide, which reduces hunger and makes people feel full longer. We can give proper information to the masses about the appropriate use of these medications. Since their approval, Ozempic in 2017 and Wagovi in 2021, the drugs have become wildly popular. I do have concerns about off-label use of semaglutide. Medical professionals worry people are using them who don't really need them, leading to shortages. I would hope that Weight Watchers would put some guide rails on the use of semaglutide. So they sh should not be recommending it to people who only want to lose five or 10 pounds. How will Weight Watchers prevent people who shouldn't be on these medications from getting these medications? First, the decision to be on a medication is gonna be based on the individual member and their healthcare provider. Our thanks to Stephanie Gosk for that report. Weight Watchers had been struggling with its subscription numbers, but this announcement that it's adding the medications sent the stock up 79% on Tuesday. And in other medical news this morning, a warning about a danger to children from something many of us have in our medicine cabinets. And new research on something on the minds of a lot of people who go running, whether they're increasing the risk of developing joint problems. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now to talk about this. Good morning, Dr. Patel. So our first study looks at the alarming rise in opioid po poisoning deaths in children. Nearly half of all poison-related deaths in children ages 5 and under were actually from opioids. So why is this happening, and what do parents need to know if children take any sort of drug that they should not? Yeah, I think, Zinclair, this is a very common problem, and researchers have been looking at data since 2005 and have seen essentially a doubling in the deaths from poisonings from opioids specifically as the leading cause under the age of five. I think that parents should always think, especially for infants, which constituted 42% of these deaths. So these are children under the age of one. Look at everything. This is why our doctor's orders today are very clear and we're going to try to emphasize them. 
locked up in a way is the best thing for all and any medications, whether you think they're dangerous or not. And then number two, always screen and scan. And this is what parents need to take note of. Think about everything that's coming in your front or back door, including people and any pills or any items that could drop because those infants, they will crawl, they will pick them up and they will likely put them in their mouth. And then also just another tip, keep your poison center's phone number handy and in many places, because unfortunately, as in clear, in many cases, these could have been potentially prevented by calling a poison center immediately. Some good advice there. All right, this next one we teased, really important topic, and that's information about the impact of scald burns from tap water. It's actually more yeah. common than you might think. Children and older adults are the ones who are especially in danger. So what can you tell us about that? And what can we do then in our own homes to try and eliminate the risk of those burns? Yeah, Joe, very quickly. So what a scald burn is essentially a type of burn on the skin that comes usually from hot water or some sort of water type of, of setting. And you might think, tap water, how could that get hot enough? Well, the United States is one of the few countries where there's just voluntary regulation of our hot water heaters. And so a safe temperature at max should be 120 degrees. But even in 120 degrees, if you're in that water for nine minutes, you can experience a burn. And if the temperature is over even 10 degrees, Joe, it can just take seconds to get one of these burns. We see them usually in younger children and unfortunately in older adults. So that brings us to today's doctor's orders. One, do a temperature check of your hot water heater. You can buy a thermometer for about $25 and do this. Number two, chill while you fill. This is a reference, and I have to do this for my own kids, that at the end of filling a tub, run the cold water. That'll help make sure that the tap itself is not that hot and the water in the tub is slightly cooler. Such important tips there. And of course, we got to talk exercise. There's some good news for any runners who might be worried about the sports impact on their bodies. A new survey of long distance runners from Northwestern Medicine looked at the long term hip or knee risks in marathon runners. I know often that's a concern for them. What exactly did they find? Yeah, they, say they looked at over 3,000 runners, and I'm smiling because I don't know how many times I've told patients who are runners that when they start getting knee problems, well, you might have to cut back on your running. But <laughs> this study actually offers enough evidence to say the opposite, that in fact, that looking at over 3,000 runners who ran long distances for different periods of time, that they didn't see a significant increase or association with arthritis from that running. And I think what's more important here is what they found that could help prevent any sort of knee injuries. And that brings us to our final set of doctor's orders. Check your shoes. Think about your shoes as something that you should replace. Even if they look fine, you need to think about changing your shoes depending on how many miles you run just to have the best support. Number two, dynamic warm-up warm -up is key. I know there's a lot of controversy. How much do I stretch? What do I do? Never skip that stretch. Dynamic warm-ups can be just movements that help get your body started before you run, even just minutes of that before a long run can make a very long distance in protecting your joints. And think of your joints like an active organ, Zinclay. They are mm. constantly reforming and evolving. So you can change the dynamics of your knees and hips and joints by just doing these simple exercises. Always gotta get that stretch in. All right, don't, right. skip, <laughs> don't skip the stretch and don't chill after it. you fill. So many great <laughs> advice yeah. here, all right. Dr. Patel, thank you so much. Thank you. And coming up, a modern industry with still a long way to go. After the break on this International Women's Day, we're going to explore the growing technology of AI. And we'll bring you the story of one woman working to make the industry more inclusive. We're back with the story of how an influencer became an identity thief. During the pandemic, Danielle Miller funded her lavish lifestyle by using the identity of innocent people to get tens of thousands of dollars in PPP loans. Now she has pleaded guilty to a fraud scheme. NBC News Now correspondent Valerie Castro has more on that story. The flashy and lavish lifestyle of a social media influencer helping to put her behind bars. Oh, watch me as I walk this way. Danielle Miller pleading guilty to a $1.5 million fraud scheme accused of stealing the identities of more than 10 people across the country to obtain COVID-19 relief money, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston. Prosecutors say Miller's social media posts documented her expensive Birkin designer handbags, which if real can cost six figures. Excursions on private jets and visits to fancy hotels, including the Beverly Hills Hotel in California, all funded by the stolen cash meant for COVID PPP loans. 
It's probably easier to catch her because she's on social media flaunting it. The criminal complaint describing a photo of Miller in front of a white Rolls Royce, the distinct hotel behind her. Investigators using the photo to match her to a fake Massachusetts driver's license. That license used to open a fraudulent bank account, eventually funded with tens of thousands of dollars in pandemic-related small business loans. When you take money from the federal government, it's a felony, so it's a serious charge, a serious indictment where if when we look at actually what she's getting charged with, it's pretty significant. The charges in this case, three counts of wire fraud and two counts of aggravated identity theft, a combined possible sentence of more than 60 years. Her attorney telling NBC News Miller has accepted responsibility for her role in the offenses as charged. Miller, who has been out on a $100,000 bond since her arrest in 2021, even documenting what some might say is her least fashionable accessory, an ankle monitor. So this is an individual actually who is flaunting what they've done and they call themselves, you know, I'm a con artist. They're proud of this and she's actually using it as another platform to define herself. While Miller's case is high profile, pandemic related fraud was and continues to be widespread. The government's Pandemic Response Accountability Committee estimating the losses are in the billions and beyond. I've said it wouldn't surprise me if at the end of this, it exceeds $100 billion in fraud. Um, it's certainly going to be tens of billions of dollars. The precise number, we just don't know yet. The victims of scammers like Miller include taxpayers, those whose identities were stolen, and those who needed the money most. Every penny that was went to a fraudster from the unemployment insurance program didn't go to someone who was unemployed. And that's, the, that's a real tragedy out of this. Our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. Last week, the White House announced a $1.6 billion plan to combat pandemic-era fraud and recover the funds. The Government Accountability Office says since the start of the pandemic, more than 1,000 people have been convicted of COVID-related fraud. That number is only expected to go up. Now to our financial headlines. Google's annual developers conference will be open to the public a first since the pandemic began. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Zinkley. Good morning to you. Yeah, so Google's annual developers conference is returning on May 10th, taking place in front of a limited in-person audience in Mountain View, California. Now, Google hasn't held a conference where anyone can pay to attend since before the pandemic. This year, it's all about the AI products that Google's developing, including BARD, the company's answer to ChatGPT. Now, it didn't make a good first impression last month, sharing false information on the James Webb telescope. Amazon says the NFL game it's streaming on Black Friday this year will be free for everyone, even if you don't have Prime. Amazon says the game will offer people a sample of the benefits that come with Prime membership. It can act as a push for fans who may be on the fence about subscribing to Prime Video to access Thursday Night Football, which Amazon is investing heavily in, and encourage people to shop on one of the biggest days of the year. Airbnb is teaming up with Ted Lasso to give fans a chance to spend a night in the show's iconic Crown and Anchor pub. The pub, which is in Richmond in southwest London, is called The Prince's Head in real life. Reservations open March 21st for three stays on October 23rd, 24th, and 25th, and it's available to the first three people who can score a booking that will cost $13 a night for parties of up to four people. I, I know so, it's a marketing move, but I love these little Airbnb <laughs> entertainment-related projects. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I know it is. It's pretty cool. I like it, too. All right. Thanks, Yvonne. I appreciate it. You got it. And today is International Women's Day, and we're taking a closer look at the discrimination women face in the tech industry. According to a 2019 UNESCO report, only 12% of artificial intelligence researchers are women, and the lack of women in artificial intelligence has a profound impact on how equitably the technology is designed. Joining us now to discuss this is Transformation and Continuous Improvement Manager and AI speaker Sarika Hussein. Thank you so much for being with us. So first off, equitable design is just so important. So what are some of the biases we see in AI systems and how has that resulted in discrimination against women specifically? Yeah, so when it comes to uh, AI, basically, uh, and the biasness in the system, uh, so there are basically two or three things that uh, uh, the way in which it can get inculcated. Um, but at a human level, when we talk about biasness, it's conscious and unconscious, with uh, conscious being the deliberate effort and unconscious is something unintentional. But when it comes to artificial intelligence, it's completely a different ballgame. We have, uh, like, the 
training data, basically the data on which these AI model works. So, it, and most of the data is captured from all the different devices like your CCTV cameras, sensors and all. So if your devices are not perfect and not capturing right information, so your uh, data is corrupted. The second one is underrepresented and it uh, calls for definitely women discrimination. That's something which gets uh, in, uh, introduced here. The reason for that is uh, because in the real world itself, we have underrepresented data. And also when we build AI model, these uh, data points gets ingested. And um, whatever historical mistakes we have done in past, uh, definitely definitely shows up in your AI model. Another one is um, when it comes uh, to AI, then we tend to settle for shortcuts because I understand it's not an easy thing mm. to convert human behavior, which is like uh, your entire uh, subjective and an abstract thing into numbers. It's it's dif difficult. So when we do multiple iterations uh, while building model, we tend to settle at a stage, mm. uh, which is earlier than expected. And that's again a uh, way how uh, it gets introduced. Amplification yeah, and Sarika, of data. I mean, one. sorry to cut in, Sarika, but to that end, you're talking about underrepresented data and so many of these issues in AI. How do we eliminate these types of bias, bias in artificial intelligence? Yeah, so in order to uh, kind of uh, eliminate this, so one is definitely whenever you sign off for any AI model, you need to critically evaluate uh, those uh, models and see if it matches with your expectations. And the other thing is uh, data I already mentioned, use correct data and enough amount of data. So the underrepresentation, as I mentioned, that cannot be used as it is. And uh, more uh, to it, nowadays, uh, we have to do things ethically. And um, uh, some positive news here, like now we have standards. So in 2022, we have now mm. ISO standards 23053, which talks about frameworks of AI uh, systems uh, in machine learning. We have uh, another one, uh, 23894, which talks about guidance to risk management. So basically, mm. these are also uh, some of the toolkits which you already have or a guiding path uh, through which you can actually eliminate bias in the system. Yeah, building ethically and equitably. So, Sarika Hussein, yeah. thank you so much. Coming Thanks. up, one man overcoming the odds. When we return, his remarkable journey from being born blind and partially deaf to becoming one of the most accomplished fiddler players of his generation. You're watching Morning News Now. Welcome back. A group of ladies at a retirement home is getting some big recognition for their tribute to Rihanna's Super Bowl halftime show. Women at the Arcadia Senior Living in Bowling Green, Kentucky, went viral for recreating the dance to the Rude Boy remix from Rihanna's performance. Well, after the video got more than 31 million views, Rihanna herself sent a bouquet of white roses to the home and included a card that called the dance amazing. Rapper Jay-Z, who produced the show, also sent 100 red roses to show his love for the recreation. One of the home's directors says that they were shocked to receive the beautiful gift and says that the stars of the viral video are loving all of the fame and attention as we are loving them. Oh my goodness, yes, I was one of the 31 million viewers <laughs> and I can say those grandmas know how to get down, Joe. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. And finally, at this hour, achieving an unlikely dream. Michael Cleveland is said by some to be one of the most accomplished fiddler players of his generation. He's won a Grammy for Best Bluegrass Album and dozens of awards, and he's been able to accomplish all of this without the ability to see. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock shows us his remarkable story. To hear Michael Cleveland play the fiddle is to experience bluegrass packed with passion and fury, the melodies of a lifelong love affair. It feels like bluegrass is in your bones. It's all I've ever really wanted to do and uh, something that I was born into. My grandparents were big fans of bluegrass music. Michael was born blind and doesn't have hearing in 80% of his left ear and a quarter of his right. 
Despite his challenges, Michael's grandparents took him to shows all over his hometown of Henryville, Indiana, starting at six months old. And by three or four, he was hooked to their eight track player. I would take one of those speakers and lay it flat on the ground and lay my right ear on that speaker and go to sleep listening to, to bluegrass. Behind the brilliance of this prodigy, a fearlessness to learn. Find a good jam session that I can get into. Now, he placed a 400-person crowds from Phoenix to Fort Myers. Oh, man, it's just a pure adrenaline rush. Boosted by a family who only wanted to share his dreams. Do you think if your grandparents today saw this? I don't think they would be surprised. They'd be darn proud. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you all. Sam Brock, NBC News, Fort Myers, Florida. What an incredible talent, and shout out to the 8-track player there. All right, that does it for Absolutely. this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.